The Nobel Prize for Literature in 2017 has been awarded to Kazuo Ishigura, a Japanese-born British novelist, best known for The Remains of the Day and other works about memories, pain, and illusions. Many people may ask, who is Kazuo Ishigura, though he is a big name in literature circles? To discuss the issues related to the Nobel Prize in Literature and beyond today, I'm pleased to be joined in the Beijing studio by David Davidin from the University of Warwick, Jonathan Locke Hart, a writer, historian, and literary scholar, and Zhao Baisheng, director of the World Autobiography Center at Peking University. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to Dialogue, gentlemen. Thank Can you. each of you brief us about anything special, if anything special, about the surprise winning writer, Kuzu Ishigura? What are the special traits? His style is distinctive. If you open up a novel, you will know right away this is an Ishigura novel, because he writes in a sparing way, in a very level, calm, contained way. His, his sentences don't sparkle and spit, you know, as, as say in a Salman Rushdie novel. So he has his own distinctive style, which is very reasoned and measured. Fortunately, he didn't follow the style of uh, satanic verses, otherwise he would have been involved in the manhunt by Iran. Well, that wasn't a matter of style, that was more the content. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm actually, I'm Professor fascinated Duff. by his uh, vision, uh, especially of novel writing because he's, he has the ambition to write an international law novel. As a professor of world literature, I, fe I find that topic fascinating. And also I would like to later compare that topic, international novel, with, with global novel, advocated by Maximum Kingston. I would say that um, it's, again, his style. It seems to me to be, have the restraint of British and Japanese mm -hmm. culture, both cultures can be very restrained. Uh, terrific detail, if you look in Remains of the Day, he takes uh, Woodhouse's butler Jeeves, turns this into a whole novel about a butler, and he shows the detail, and there's terrific, um, uh, I would say, uh, tension between the spareness of the style and the emotion that is being repressed by this butler, because he won't uh, see his father die, he won't profess love, he is addicted to his work, and so he gives up his life for this work, and it's done in a very basic, beautiful, restrained way. Do you think it is the style or the contents that would matter eventually? Well, I didn't see how you can separate the two. Um, when, he, when he's uh, writing about the his English novel, which is um, The Remains of the Day, the style is, as you said, very English, very Japanese as well. I don't see what... What, but what do you mean by Japanese? What do you mean by... British? British? Well, 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 look, okay, British. look, <laughs> look. Um, you know there is a tradition in Japanese literature of, 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 of exploring pathos, yes? Mm -hmm. Of exploring pathos. It's the Virgil, um, the only Latin I know, Sunt Lacri My Rerum, <laughs> which is there are tears in things. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a whole tradition of Japanese writing mm -hmm. that deals with a nostalgia for the past, a sense of pathos of loss, and a sense of the transience of life. Yes. So that is where he, that, that is his style, that is his, um, that is his content. And so the style has to be also measured. It's a measured lament. Mm -hmm. It's not King Lear, which is howling lament. Mm -hmm. It's a more measured poignancy. It's poignant. Mm -hmm. Now, there are writers who, who say that is a very limited achievement. I know people like Wilson Harris who will say, no, writers should be looking for the cracks in reality that give you a glimpse into, into otherness and, 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 to, and to something that transcends us as human beings, as opposed to social realism and pathos. But then writers are all di diverse, you know. You know, we're all diverse. We, we just put our little contribution on the table and we walk away. Ishigura, by the way, is a wonderful, unegotistical, gentle, mm -hmm. gently spoken, unassuming human being. So when I heard that he won the Nobel Prize, I beamed because I once had the honor of sharing a platform with him and listening to him talking about what he wants to write about. And he definitely said, I don't want my sentences to, to be full of flourishes. 
-hmm. He wants to work in a sparing way. He actually said, I want to avoid metaphors, mm -hmm. which is remarkable for a writer. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, actually that today, I think that for the education, especially for literary education, people pay very little attention to style. And I, so a lot of young scholars got the impression that, oh, this is old school of scholars who emphasize the training of style. So you can see, uh, for example, about 50 years ago, even 30 years ago, people pay a great attention to style. And uh, especially you have the book, like Elements of Style, or these books train generations of writers. Mm -hmm. For me, I think, for a writer, the style is the passport of a writer. And it's, it's so, true, yeah. uh, absolutely. I think the style is important because I'm sure it's the same in a lot of, or I'm not sure, but I would guess or imagine <laughs> it's the same in a lot of cultures, is that some things endure. But of course there's content and style and content go together. Yeah. So obviously the remains of the day is also the remains of the British Empire mm -hmm. and how England has changed from a very central place to a place that's losing its power. So it's, it's a private lament for the life of this butler and the people he've no, he's known, but it's about the great house and the end of sort of the, the last bit of feudalism and the end of empire. So it's private nostalgia, private elegy, and mm -hmm. public elegy. <laughs> but I think mm -hmm. the two go hand in hand, and I think that eventually style it has to have content, but if it's not good writing, it mm -hmm. might get a prize, but in time, people won't find it as interesting. Yeah, Generally, yeah. you know, I'm a little bit surprised that the name of the book that went big is not called The Remains of the Islands, because he, <coughs> he was a young boy, and he moved from one island nation to the right. other, mm -hmm. from Japan to the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the implications uh, if you introduce elements of comparison between the two island nations that somehow represent the national character of the Japanese? Uh, I, I don't think this was, a, this was his... In, I don't think he started writing his novel thinking of these things. Right. I think he started writing his novel because he wanted That's to... Perhaps you don't know enough well, about he, the Japanese. He, he, no, he, <laughs> he's, he's actually said... He's actually described in great detail in interviews how he wrote The Remains of the Day why he started it and how he continued it or how he finished it. And basically he wanted to explore the condition of England, which is his own condition as an outsider. Mm -hmm. You know, he's an outsider, he's an immigrant. Mm -hmm. And you know, so he feels um, that he's also in the, uh, in the periphery, very much like the butler, mm -hmm. who's central to the novel, but mm -hmm. socially is peripheral. And to say that too, mm -hmm. because what happens is that the butler at one point, to pick up on your point, mm -hmm. says, you know, there are manservants on the continent, but mm. there are butlers in England. So he does say, as an island culture, yeah. that they wouldn't quite understand a butler. So when they have German and French mm -hmm. and other guests, even American guests, they don't quite understand what a butler, what is, a yeah. butler is. And his yeah. father, mm. Stephen Sr., had been a butler. Mm. And it's also about the fact that his father moves in and becomes an under-butler. Mm -hmm. And he's too busy, really, to be there when his father dies because he wants to serve the people in the great house. Oh, and, yeah, I, well, I, what do you I, think I, of uh, yeah. the uh, zealous pursuit by Japanese to learn from European styles? So twice, mm -hmm. if you look at the Meiji Restoration as well as post-war reconstruction with the end of the Second World War, the Japanese uh, desperately try to disengage from okay. Asian cultures and to get integrated with okay. the European culture. Let me say one thing about that. If you look at the... In Chinese, it's a Toya rule, right? Yeah, but yeah, if you yeah, see yeah. this, it happened in English culture too, because English was a little island off the coast of Eurasia, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. Europe, because it's, I mean, Af actually yeah. Africa, mm -hmm. Asia, and Europe are all really the same continent. If you want to walk to Cape Town, you can. Mm -hmm. If you want to walk to Paris, you can from here. Mm -hmm. And so, basically, what you have in, in Britain is a culture of translation. The English were always translating Latin and Greek and Italian and French and learnt, Shakespeare learned that in school. They didn't yeah. use English. So it's all about going out and mm. learning about the world. Britain expanded out of weakness. Japan expanded out of weakness because yeah. Britain knew it needed things in Asia and around mm. the world that it didn't have in its own culture and it wasn't especially rich. So I think sometimes ideas mm. follow trade routes. I, th yeah. I think, mm -hmm. I, I, I think mm -hmm. I, if I want to put Yanri's question into a broader perspective, yeah. I think that we can relate 
uh, Yangri's question to the island culture. Oh, well, the sense of crisis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and also Ishiguro, because from, uh, from, from the perspective of the Chinese, we can see that uh, Ishiguro had uh, a, a big vision, tried to big vision, because we always try to categorize uh, in, from mainland countries, we always try to categorize these people from island <laughs> countries, like from uh, Japan and UK. So uh, we, we use a term which was insularity, right? So instead and of Australia. yeah, 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 and, and, and instead of conquering this insularity, so that's why Ishiguro proposed a very ambitious term. That is, he's a novelist of bigger vision. That is the concept of international novel. Yes. Yeah. Well, all I could add to that is to just mm. to reinforce what Jonathan has said. Mm. When the ships left Liverpool in England mm -hmm. and came back with cotton and tobacco and rum mm -hmm. and some slaves, mm -hmm. they also brought back texts. <laughs> right. They also yeah. brought back other people's books. And mm -hmm. England, I think it's wrong to think of England as an insular place culturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think the English have always gone out, mm. including today. It, also in search, well first of all to dominate other cultures, mm -hmm. but also in search of, of um, the wisdom and the, and the virtues and the aesthetics of other cultures. No, I, d I, don't, mean, I don't mean that means the people are, they are, they are uh, I, mean, I don't mean the island people right, from like Japan and UK, they are, they, they, they are insular. Oh. I mean, they when, when they try to overcome this insularity, yes. they always go to extremes. Right. That's okay. what I'm saying. But I think what happens oh. too is they're yeah. seafaring people because they're <laughs> surrounded by water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so they have to go out. But in mm. a sense, um, mm. if you saw the, the great Chinese expeditions, the naval ones, mm -hmm. eventually the emperor says enough because China is big mm -hmm. and self-sufficient mm -hmm. and strong. Uh, we saw the way world center of the universe. Right. <laughs> self-sufficient. <laughs> Middle kingdom. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that for all these cultures, we're all in the same human family, and what happens is we trade ideas and stories mm -hmm. and everything else, and eventually it doesn't matter where something was invented. To come to two other things we've talked about, yeah. come back to two things. First of all, islands. It yeah. depends on the size of the island, obviously, but in yeah, the Caribbean, right. where we have our Nobel Prize winner, Derek Walker, yeah. he always talked about being caught between two immensities, immensity. which is the immensity of the sky <laughs> and uh, of the sea, which made him humble. It humbled him. Yeah. It humbled him. Mm -hmm. Because then you suddenly realize you're just a puny human being, right. yeah, subject yeah. to wind, hurricane, yeah, that's true. the sky, and the mm -hmm. sea. Second thing is that uh, he, he, he made this famous statement, no nation but the imagination. No yeah. nation but the but imagination. Yeah, I would want to imagine the uh, imagine the community. That is the imagine the community. Yes, well, community. Well, no, it's Benedict's book, Arnold. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, you are Anderson. watching dialogue uh, related to yeah. issues on the Nobel Prize in Literature and Beyond today. I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by David David Dean from the University of Warwick, Jonathan Lockhart, a writer, historian, and literary scholar, and Zhao Baisheng from Peking University. We're discussing why a Japanese British writer uh, Kazuo Ishiguro has won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Stay with us, we'll be right back. <laughs> the themes with which uh, Ishiguro is most associated are memory, time and self-delusion. Do you agree the experience of loss is the key to understanding Ishiguro's artistic temperament? We've been discussing the sense of crisis uh, mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. island nations that is beset by turbulent waters, why Japan vowed to disengage itself from Asia which it thought was inferior to European cultures and civilization. Do you think uh, uh, it is against this broader cultural background that Ishiguro was able to win the prize, the laureate? Well, I don't know whether that's why he won the prize, but I, I do know that a sense of loss yeah, yeah. Uh, right. is Im this is imbued this novel, mm -hmm. which is set in Japan, and mm -hmm. it's about the Japanese, a Japanese artist trying to come to mm -hmm. terms with the, 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 the brutal actions of Japan and an artist who sells out his art and becomes a police informer as a result of which fellow artists are jailed. Mm -hmm. well, yes. And also you can uh, see... So and Ishiguro is trying to come to terms. Yeah, yeah. And also you can see also the, the gnawing sense of loss also in this book. Because this, uh, this book is, has something to do with China because the background is in Shanghai. So mm -hmm. this is called When We Were Orphans yeah. and translated into Chinese called Shanghai Orphans. That means Shanghai Guar. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so this, this, this book is interesting in that because this book is the, the theme, the major theme of the book is possible. You know, uh, by sense, long, a lot uh, of the losers have felt they are the victims of uh, globalization. <laughs> and <laughs> President Trump rose on the platform of a loss, of a sense of loss. The white losers in the Rust Belt, they felt they have been left, they have been left marginalized by globalization. They supported his efforts to reject the establishment, reject right. elites, and reject the immigration. And Brexit was like that. Too. <laughs> so, but, but, but they, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was saying, but with respect, what you're trying to do mm-hmm. is to drag literature into a political, right. economic and argument. And that was going to be my point. Is well, that you go one of the you things to to say what David is saying is that if you never let me go was made into a, a British film adaptation yeah, and also into a Japanese yeah, yeah. television series. Yeah, yeah. So that's very interesting that he's claimed by both countries. And I think the issue of refugees, asylum seeking, is also yeah. a sense of loss, right? For sure. those who have to yeah, leave yeah. their homeless homes behind, homeless. homeland behind. I'll just add one thing is that the, in a sense, Ishiguro as an immigrant mm-hmm. is somebody it, who has given so much to England and Britain that we have to sometimes think about immigrants as adding that refugees come and they you give us your poor like the Statue of Liberty mm. they add the Chinese workers who built the railways in Canada and, and the United mm-hmm. States mm-hmm. all the people who have done so much they're not somebody to say well we're going to keep you away they're actually adding to the abilities of that country to be global and everything yeah. else. Mm-hmm. And but what I would unfortunately, say these uh, Chinese immigrants and workers who contributed so much to the construction of railways in the United States and North America right. have been rejected by the Exclusion Act. Exactly. And yeah, American yeah. lawmakers did apologize to the Chinese. Yeah, same with the Canadian yeah, yeah. Chinese. But then you can also say that the Canadian Governor General, who was the, uh, at one time, who was the uh, representative of the Queen in Canada, was born in Hong Kong, and mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. Lieutenant Governor of Alberta was a, uh, a Canadian football player, like American mm-hmm. football, who, mm-hmm. who was from China. So it's a very mixed story. Complex, and yes. in yeah, yeah, Ishigura, yeah. what I think is he sees details, the remains, and through the private act of his style, mm-hmm. he has public implications about yeah. politics and so on, but it is mm-hmm. literature. Yeah, but to pick up what you're saying about immigrants, it's very interesting and even ironic that um, the, 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 the writers who are considered to be the best or among the best British writers today yeah. are Even immigrants, right. yeah, whether Ishigura or Rushdie, Rushdie or uh, Nepal, um, Nepal, right. Nepal right. well, obviously Nepal, yeah. uh, Hanif Qureshi, Grace yeah. Nichols. Look, gentlemen, I have this very nasty sense. Excuse me, gentlemen, I have this nasty sense. As if all the guys, all those who had won, who have won Nobel Prize for literature, mm-hmm. uh, somehow come from Britain or from uh, former British colonies. Uh, it seems that they are all William Shakespeare's. I mean, this is an issue of uh, but pride and prejudice. But this is a Scandinavian is a committee who's doing this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a British it's not committee. A British committee. It's to, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So and why are the Norwegians yeah. and the yeah. and and eventually the Swedes making these choices? I, I said yeah. so. Uh, yeah. should because uh, is <laughs> there a chance of giving the Nobel Literature Prize to mm. uh, British authors born elsewhere? For example, the 2001 winner. Was just uh, Napol yes, is from uh, Trinidad, from Trinidad and uh, yeah. Tobago, and the yeah. 2007 honoree Doris uh, Lessing yes. was a native of Iran who grew up in Zimbabwe. Yeah. No, no, I don't. I don't think that he, she's a native of Iran. She's uh, she's she, she was born in Iran and she raised in in. Not, we cannot say. Zimbabwe, we say Rhodesia, 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 before the independence of Zimbabwe in the early 1980s. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, English is the dominant language of the world. It's the language of science and it's the language of the internet. Yeah. And therefore, people tend to know literature in English more than they know literature in Slovakian or Which Chinese. Which isn't fair. It's all about translation right. and the yeah. absolute importance of translation. Yeah. I think so. The more Chinese. Yeah. Right, that's fiction. my next question, that gentlemen. China yeah. was once considered the fount of all knowledge for Japan. However, more Japanese writers have been recognized by the West, such as uh, mm-hmm. Haruki Murakami, whose books and stories have been yeah, bestsellers yeah. internationally. Yeah. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. even Chinese classics like Journey to the West or Red, The Dream of the Red Mansion are not well known in the West. Do you think this is eventually an issue of translation? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, I think, sorry, I, yeah, yeah, I think the, this will change, but maybe, this maybe in, change. In, in, in the Mu near future. Yan, uh, in, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I think also spirit. China is stepped back into the world stage more in yes. the last 50 years. Yes. It takes time, yeah. and it just seems to me it's inevitable 
that with the cultural depth and, uh, of, of China, that good things are going to happen. I, I, think, I think, first of all, it's with something to do with the language policy, because I'm still thinking about the language policy, right? Because today, so you can see clearly, all over the world, people, when they learn foreign language, they always choose English. But now the situation began to change. For example, even in the UK, right? So far, I, I just read reports recently that in the UK, for the, let me see, for the elite families, they sent their children to the school who their first lang foreign language is Chinese. So that means for each well, nation... Well, I'm afraid this is an issue of self-inflation. It's blown out of proportion. No, it's a not. Bit. In England... It's not? No, no, no. My children... Well, Tony no, Blair said one of his children yeah. did learn well, my Mandarin. My children are learning Mandarin in an English school at, yeah. the, at this very moment. Many, many British parents want their children to learn Mandarin because they know that China is the future. Now, the, my understanding is that the, the government is pumping a lot of resources into soft power. Yeah. I don't really like that term, soft power. Mm -hmm. It's just filmmaking. I was just talking with uh, Joseph Knight this morning. Filmmaking, yeah. soft power. literature, translation. We know, the, we know America because yeah. we know Hollywood. Yeah, I would, I would like to pick up your topic, WC, because you just mentioned the topic. We haven't answered the question. The question is, why, why so many Nobel Prizes awarded to people who has this cross-cultural background. I think that there is, oh. a, yeah, uh, right? I, th uh, I think that there's a very important uh, thing that I want to mention is that because of these people has varied cultural background. So when they write, it's always easy for them pr to produce a cross-fertilization. I mean, culturally. Cross-cultural yeah. perspectives, yes. yes. But also because they're minorities and the, the West is, especially the Nobel Committee, I would imagine, is fairly progressive multiculturalism, certain things, and cultures that, that are like that, they actually like. But it seems to me that, you know, China, one of the things I say to my students at Shanghai Jiao Tong, or if I'm visiting at yeah. Beida or whatever, is look, your job as young Chinese students is to go out and tell the world about the treasures of but China. But gentlemen, I'm afraid uh, I disagree with you, because uh, a few <laughs> years ago, uh, yeah. Angela Merkel, Nicolas Sarkozy, and David Cameron all agreed that multiculturalism has failed in continental Europe because of the uh, uh, obstacles and the frustrations they have met uh, uh, against the uh, broad uh, background of uh, asylum-seeking crisis, the tsunami mm. that uh, wreaked the havoc with European politics and economy. So I, th I think that they, I think that they, that may be the consensus of politicians, right? Maybe the rise of a far-right movement. Yeah, as what, what about we disagree? We yes. definitely disagree with you. Right. Populism. But what about a country yes. like Canada, where it works very well, and that the prime minister yeah, just made it more Australia. Australia. In, in in Australia. Australia. The mayor of London is Muslim, yes. the son of a bus driver. To, to, to say that diversity is not valued in the West is completely wrong. It's With completely wrong. Yeah. Jewish, the politicians may not that, value that, it. That is, I think, Donald I think Trump may look no, no, yeah, around. But no, no, I think uh, that is Mr. the... Mr. Dafari, uh, who is the, uh, the, the name of the uh, independence movement leader in Britain? Uh, Nafari? Yeah, but you're talking mm -hmm. about... Uh, I, th I think, I think that is the lunatic. Of you're talking about the lunatic right. Yeah. You're talking about the lunatic right, the yeah. fringe right. Ferrari or Nafari? Ferrari. Farage. Uh, for, yeah. Farage. 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 Nigel Farage. Farage. But who takes Farage seriously, yeah, apart from true. a few rednecks yeah, yeah. <laughs> and skinheads <laughs> and thugs? But you see, the other thing yeah. that happens too is London, <laughs> yeah. Northern Ireland, and Scotland voted against Brexit. Yeah. Some of the rural areas and the older people, the young people, are very global. I, I, think, I, I, th I think that they say that they, they, they set that for purpose, right? Especially these politicians, right? Because they only see the conflicts and mm -hmm. also they, mm -hmm. uh, they try to capitalize on this, on, 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 on this on, continent, on conflict, popular yes. continents and conflicts. But, but there is something no. invisible. Right? London, I, I have to say, London and like Toronto, Toronto yeah. wonderfully and New diverse. York. Yeah, yeah. And the diversity is part of, the diversity is very creative. Yeah. First of all, immigrants work harder. Yeah, than, than yeah. local people, yeah. because they're more hungry, you know. And Secondly, they want yeah. to write themselves into the society. That's why, that's why immigrant yeah. literature always produce good writers. Yeah. And yeah. also, yeah. it's yeah. counterfactual because Asian Americans and Asian Canadians are the best paid people in those two yes. countries. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they're, the, so they're, they're hardworking, they're considered to be great immigrants, and there's so a, there's they a are dark also path. the best paid in the Silicon Valley right. in yeah, yeah. That's, the that's United States. Of that's, that's another example to refute the arguments. That's of what the I'm politicians. refuting with that, is that yeah. the, these people are incredibly important to the economies mm -hmm. of the West. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, do all sorts of great oh. things. And then people react in very old-fashioned yeah. ways. Mm -hmm. We're in a global world. 
it's a human family <laughs> yeah. and we have to wake up to that yeah. and yeah. that means we have to understand China more. <laughs> I have to say uh, very briefly that my first president in Guyana for 10 years, my first president in Guyana for 10 years was Chinese and he was the grandson of migrant workers from Fujian province. Mm -hmm. Imagine, that is the Chinese dream, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, well, and so well my interpretation of Chinese dream. Yeah, 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 but a migrant, you know, talking about refugees and migrant workers and we look scornfully upon them, mm -hmm. they become our presidents and vice chancellors. Yeah, and gentlemen, uh, time is running out, but oh. uh, one of my last questions is really about uh, how many more Chinese writers will be able to win the Nobel Prize for Literature as more and more brilliant <laughs> scholars and students uh, come yeah. back from Europe and North America yeah. with a good command of English. Also, a better understanding of uh, Western cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think uh, with the uh, language barriers being steered, cleared away gradually through good translation, uh, do you think uh, more of such literary works like uh, Moya? Moya, Moya, we both agree, well, he may yeah. not be the best. But because of the greater influence and right. uh, due to True. translation of so many mm -hmm. of his books, he was able to win a Nobel Prize. Do you think uh, when President Xi Jinping said China has never been so close to the center stage of world mm -hmm. uh, economics and politics, uh, do you think we have never been so close to the center stage of a world literature? You, you actually China? were the center of the world until about 1800 and you will be That's again. Chris yeah. Patton, last governor yeah, of Hong yeah. Kong, said. But it's true. If you look at the economy, India and China were the center yeah. of the world. Europe was not, and it's happening again. So it's inevitable to me that China will, in culture, and you have incredibly bright students, just as you said, and I'm sure they, in all fields, including literature, they will do marvelously. I, I think, I think, I think I, I normally when I'm interviewed, I refuse to be a prophet because it's always dangerous, it's to, dangerous be a prophet, yes. to, to be a prophet at home. So, but I can say that in China today, especially younger generation, we have uh, a galaxy of brilliant writers, mm. and, and I think that they are very hopeful. Maybe we, we can. I shall never say never. We should never underestimate the power of a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> Thank you so much for being part of this meaningful dialogue on the future of more Chinese winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. I hope I can live that long to see the glories of Chinese writers on the center stage of world literature. Until that day, goodbye. <laughs>